The title of our message this morning is Living in the Faith Zone. We know about zones, about the twilight zone, right? And some other kind of zones. Living in the faith zone. Last week we spoke about needing to break out in order to break through in situations and problems, whether it's spiritual or natural. We saw how an Israelite named Shemgar used an ox god to protect the Israelites from the fearsome Philistines that had come to ravage and kill. When they saw one man with this tool kill 600 of their armed soldiers, they got scared and ran out. They want to come into that town, right? We also spoke about be instant, be prepared in season, in opportunities, and out of season as well in 2 Timothy 4.2. Remember, God has already given us talents and gifts and spiritual power to overcome anything and everyone in our natural and our spiritual life. Only one person agrees. Are you awake? All right. If you missed that message, go get it. It'll rev you up a little bit. But this morning, we're going to look at living in the faith zone. Not only believing, but using what God has already given us to accomplish God's plan for our lives. Amen? Our text is found in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, a very famous chapter. As you find it, would you stand with me as we honor the word of God? Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That makes no sense at all, does it? Hmm? In verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God, him. For he that and she that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Lord bless the reading of his word, and bless the servant as he brings this forth. You may be seated. When we're talking about diligently, it means pursuing, painstakingly, tireless, searching for something. Hallelujah. God is a rewarder, not just in heaven, by the way, even here on earth. Come on. Did you get off the train or what? We have to learn to trust God not only when we're in trouble, but all the time. Maybe we wouldn't get in trouble if we did. Whatever season or opportunity you're in, speak to God in your prayers. There's an old song that said it, I need thee, Lord. I need thee every hour. Mm -hmm. Every hour I need thee. There isn't an hour of the day when we can't be hurt or go into a situation that will hurt us. You see, living in the faith zone means reaching out to nothing mm -hmm. and holding on until it becomes something. Let me say it again. Reaching out to nothing until it becomes something. Hmm? How many people have told you you'll never be successful, you'll never do this and never do that, and you believed it? What did God say about you? Hmm? Did you ask him? He's got plans that the Bible tells us we can't even imagine for every one of us, young and old. Hallelujah. You see, living in the faith zone means that something is happening. There's a place, there's a time when we experience the power and the presence of God in a powerful way. How many know what I'm talking about? Hmm? Most of us believers want to live in the safe zone, though, although. Hmm? We want to be safe, satisfied. But that's not what God wants for us spiritually. Hmm? He doesn't want us to just be safe. He wants us moving and doing the things that he has created us to do. You see, if we stay in the safe zone, we'll never see the miracles, never get to see and experience the supernatural power of God in the safe zone. Hmm? In the faith zone, you learn to depend on God. He is Lord. He's the boss. He's in charge. Hallelujah. See, as long as we say in the safe zone, we're not going to grow spiritually and we're not going to experience his blessings. 
even in the natural. There is much more God has for us after we're saved. Salvation is so powerful, but it's not the end. It's the beginning of all that God wants to do in us and through us and for us. Hallelujah. Being a Christian is exciting. If you're bored, you're not doing it right. You need to go back to the book. Every day should be a challenge and excitement, something happening. Hallelujah. God is knocking on, on the door of your heart. He's trying to get your attention so we can step out of our safe zone with the Spirit of God, lead us into the faith zone. Hallelujah. We will see who God is. Hmm? Because when you're in the faith zone, you don't have any doubts or fears because God is going to do the work. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. It's like the Israelites in Egypt in bondage, living daily in pain. With no hope. But they thought they were safe. And they weren't. When you're safe is when you're in trouble. But in Christ, we're not safe. We're in the faith zone with all its right and privileges. You see, in order to experience the promised land, they had to break out not only of Egypt, but out of this mindset, this destructive mindset into the faith zone that eventually led them into the land of promise but it took them 40 years to figure it out. Talk about cabotost. Cabeza duro. They're hard-headed. And but when they did, when they finally came into the faith zone, they saw the, the God move mountains that were in the way and, and parted seas to bring them to God's promised land. Hallelujah. The word of God is full of men and women who walked into the faith zone from the safe zone and accomplished great and mighty things for God. Isn't that what we're going to do? Huh? Look at Noah. God says, build an ark. What? No rain. It hadn't rained. All the mist came up. There was no rain. There were no floods. There were no tsunamis or monsoons. Build this ark, this huge ark. I mean, you talk about foolishness. They had never seen anything like it. Hmm? The ark. But look what happened when it began to rain. Noah was in the ark. He was in the, he was in the faith zone. Hallelujah. Look at David and Goliath, and even David becoming king. He had to go through certain things to get into the faith zone. And Moses, in the promised land that we spoke about, they saw manna from heaven. They saw wa water from the rock. The birds came. All these things, and they were still complaining. My goodness. How about Queen Esther? One day she went before the king. In, in, she went from the safe zone to the faith zone because the, to talk to the king without an appointment could mean you died, even if you were the queen. But she did that and saved her people from annihilation. Hallelujah. How about Paul? Look at his ministry. You talk about the faith zone. That man was all over the world bringing the gospel, being beaten up, almost drowned, was stoned to death, got up and walked away. All these things in the, in the faith zone. Even the 11 disciples that went out and went through the whole world bringing the gospel, all of them except one being a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. How about Mary and Joseph? We're about to celebrate Christmas. <laughs> I'm pregnant, but uh, you're not the father. I don't know who the father is. People have tried that now, too. It took a lot of faith for Joseph to say, you know what? God spoke to me. God spoke to her. They had to take the ridicule of all the people and the look. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. How about Abraham? One of the greatest examples of the faith zone. Man, 80 years old, God says, leave your family, leave your everything you have, all, all people you know, and follow me. Wow. Wow. You see, when we learn to enter and listen to the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, we'll enter the faith zone and be blessed beyond measure as we also learn to bless others. The faith zone is not so we can be blessed. It's really about blessing others. Hallelujah. There's an interesting story. You can read the whole story in Genesis 24. As we mentioned Abraham, Abraham was a great man because he was a man of faith. He's listed in the Hebrews 11 chapter, in the faith chapter. But here's a man, everywhere he went, look it up, God blessed him even when he messed up. <laughs> now, you figure that out, right? 
You figure that out. Everywhere he went, and no matter what he did, God blessed him. You remember the story when he, he and Lot, they had gotten so wealthy, and Lot wasn't part of the blessing, but he stood with Abraham, and it got splashed on him, right? They had so many cattle that the, the cattle couldn't get enough grazing thing. So Abraham, who was the senior of the two, said, listen, you pick where you're going to go, and I'll pick second, which he didn't have to do. What did, they, what did Lot do? Ooh, he looked at the green pastures, but those pastures led to Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, it says, took the rocky ground where it didn't look like anything could happen, but God blessed him. Hallelujah. You may be in rocky ground, but you know there might be oil there or diamonds or something else. Hallelujah. But Abraham, the Bible tells us, Abraham was old and well stricken with age. I love that chapter. His wife had died. And the next chapter starts out like this. Go read it. He got married again to a younger woman. <laughs> He's 120-something years old and has six sons. <laughs> the faith zone. <laughs> but the Bible says, and the Lord had blessed him, here it comes, in all things, not only spiritually, but in everything he did. Young people, God's going to bless you if you stick with him. Hallelujah. It's going to be exciting. Hallelujah. The path that God has for you. At this time in history, we read this. Culturally, it was the family, the parents who chose who your husband or wife would be. I remember that when I was a kid, people still did that. Some of you come from cultures where they're still doing that today. The families have to agree on the marriage. Hmm? So here's Abraham. Apparently, he has a man in charge of all his holdings. And I mean, he was a very, very, very rich man. His name was Eliezer. And he was a believer. And one day he calls this trusted man to him. Because it was time for Isaac, his son, the son of promise, to get married. Now imagine Abraham coming to you and said, listen, I want you to go out and find a woman that my son should marry. Would you want to get into that deal? <laughs> Here's this man that has everything trusting you with something that important. Now, now think about it. Here is Abraham and Isaac, and the next generation would be who? What? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is going to bring on the institution or the heritage that will lead to Jesus Christ. That's how important it was. Eliezer did a smart thing. When somebody gives you one of those impossible tasks, don't look on the computer. Don't ask everybody that you know. Don't even ask the pastor. Ask God. How do you find the right wife for a, a man or the right, wife, uh, uh, a right man for a woman? In Genesis 24, uh, 14, he prays this prayer. God, may the right woman you want, oh, you like that? You want. Not Abraham wants, but you want to marry Isaac. Offer me water for me to drink. That's not so hard, right? And my camels also. Hold on, you're going to see how bad, how hard that was. This man travels over 500 miles looking for this woman that he had asked God, show me who she is, if she'll not only give me water, but also f water all my camels. Ten of them. Mm. He starts across the desert from Mesopotamia, and he ends up in a place called Nahor, 500 miles from where he started. And at some point, he stops here by a well of water, and he waits, waits on God. Hmm? 
with his camels. He's thirsty. The camels are thirsty. They had gone all this distance, right? Now, it's very common at the time for women to go and fetch the water for the family early in the morning when it wasn't so hot and later in the evening as sunset came. So women were coming and going at different times of the day, but none of them, none of them fulfilled his prayer. At sunset, a beautiful woman came for water. Now look at this guy. He's been traveling 500 miles. He didn't stay in a hotel. He must have smelled nice. The camel smelled even better. He looked like a homeless guy, probably. And she walks over to him and says, would you like some water? Hmm. And she takes her bucket and dips it in the well and brings him a drink of water. Then she says, after he had drank the water, by the way, I'll also water your camels. Now listen, this is not an easy thing. This woman, whose name is Rebecca, had just consented to water Elias's ten camels. Camels known as the ships of the desert because they can travel long distances without having to stop for water. Their hump is actually a, a, water, a water carrier. But each camel holds 40 gallons of water. Each one. <laughs> These camels were on empty. So Rebecca would have to dip her bucket and walk to each camel and have him. They couldn't pour it in. Hmm? You talk about patience, right? 400 gallons of water for 10 camels. It would take her almost four hours to complete this task. And it was getting dark. This was a special woman, a woman that caught the attention of God. After her marriage to Isaac, she would become the great, 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 great granddaughter of Jesus Christ. My goodness. Little did she know that these animals, these camels, carried sacks of diamonds and gold and silver and jewelry and clothing that would be gifts to the family of the woman that he found for Isaac. Mm -hmm. Anybody listening? It's not always what it appears to be. Hmm? Why was this woman so blessed of God? She passed the test. She didn't just do her job, which is to go get the water and bring it home and even give a glass of water to some stranger. That was her job, the customs. But she went beyond the custom, beyond expectation, when she watered the ten camels. Most people, even believers, try to do as little as possible in life for other people. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord, brother, <laughs> sister. Right? I'll just do what I'm paid to do. Mm -hmm. No more, no less. Only do what I can gain from. Know anybody like that? Look in the mirror. We all have that. We want to give the least in everything, but expect the most. Amen, I'll say it for you. Jesus told his disciples one day something in the Bible that you can't understand unless you understand the culture. Matthew 5 and 41. The people and the disciples that were listening, he said this, and whosoever compels you, which is what? An order, right? To go one mile, go with them too. Now, what in the world does that mean? Hmm? Go the extra mile. Well, it's a statement that refers to a practice that the Roman soldiers practiced all over the known world. When they went from place to place, they had to carry their armor and all their belongings with them and so on and so on. Some of you have been in the service, you know what I'm talking about. They would kind of pick people along the way. Yo, come here. Carry this one mile. They had authority 
to get people to do it for one mile. And I guess when they got to the mile, they had to pick somebody else. Hmm? What was Jesus saying? Your enemy, the Roman soldiers, the oppressors, if they ask you, you're the believer, if they ask you to go one mile, but because you're a Christian, go too. Is somebody listening? What he's saying here? Because you're a Christian, go too. Two miles. Freely, without even asking them, uh, you to do it. So you can witness to them that I am in your life. When you do something not expected, people are willing to listen. When you go beyond what you're supposed to do. Hmm? Hmm? Jesus even said to them, accept your righteousness, right? Which could be your deeds. Exceed that of the Pharisees, the religious priests. You won't go to heaven. Whoa, that's strong, isn't it? Matthew 5 and 20. The Pharisees, the priests of the time, were known only to do what was required of them. That's it. That's it. No more. Our greatest witness where we work, where we live, where we play, where we go to school, in church, in the community, is doing something extra for people, not just your family. Hmm? Hmm? Going behind the expected, the quota and the minimum. Now listen carefully, young people, because you're going to get something that will take you high in, 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 in the world, even in the natural. As a believer in Jesus Christ, our testimony in the workplace is not to be a slacker, someone looking to get out of things, a quitter, a lazy person, a clock watcher, a complainer, a thief. Hmm? But going beyond the expected. On our job, when we, when you, when you, on a job, when you come in late, go home early, Hide from the boss. <laughs> We're not in the faith zone. We're in the fake zone. Not the faith zone, the fake zone. I'm a believer. Believe in what? Hmm? <laughs> I worked for a captain who was an ex-Marine, fought in Iwo Jima, took a bullet hole, bullet wound. He was a tough guy. He said to me one day, John, I don't trust anyone who doesn't drink with me. That's a famous saying in the world. Hmm? Now it's do drugs with me. I said, Captain, I'm going to be your best worker. He laughed. And later on, he told me, John, you are my best worker. The world is looking for honest people, hardworking people who do their best whether or not the boss is watching or there. Are you listening? I've been a supervisor for over 50 years. I had a saying when I went to different places. I said, I take care of the people that work for me, and I take care of the people that don't. The world is looking for people who are willing to go the extra mile. You want to stand out in school? You want to stand out at work? You want to stand out in the community? Do something extra not just what is acceptable. When we act like Christians on our jobs, everything will be blessed because you're there. Are you listening? If you are there as a Christian, a born-again believer, that place will be blessed, whether it's a job or a community or a college or a school. It'll be blessed. I was at a funeral recently, and I happened to see a a retired detective I hadn't seen in many, many years. And he introduced me to some of his friends there. And this is what he said. And I'm not saying this to make me look good. He says, you see this man? When he was my sergeant, he, pr he prayed over us every time we went out the door. We had roll call. And I would say, gentlemen, we had some ladies at the time. May God watch and protect us on this tour. And sometimes it got so busy that I forgot to say it. And I'd say, fall out. And nobody moved. These are cynical people. I said, what's wrong? You didn't give the blessing. They would not walk out that door. 
Thank God I never lost one of my people. You see how powerful you are? No, that's not about me. It's about him. We have to let people know who we are by our actions, not just our mouth. Hmm? Hallelujah. Ever work in a place you don't want to be? Get an assignment you don't like? It happened to me a number of times. My first thing was, God, why am I being punished? What did I do wrong? I made a lieutenant right after the layoffs, and him, myself and another lieutenant end up in the Bronx. The Bronx. I had to take the ferry, the bus, and the train every night. And I'm saying to myself, God, why are you doing this to me? Two and a half hours each way on a midnight shift. Hmm? With Tuesday and Wednesday off. Get on the train, 59th Street. As soon as the doors closed, everybody took out a knife or a weapon. These are the good people on the train. <laughs> I figured it out. The next stop was 125th Street, and usually these wolf packs would get on and rob everybody, right? That was don't mess with me kind of thing. I would work till 8 o'clock in the morning, take the train, the ferry, the bus, end up in front of this building here at 10 o'clock, 10 to 10, go wash my face, teach Sunday school, sit through the service, Go home, go to sleep, and get up again. When people say, I can't do it, Pastor, I says, you don't have no idea what I can't do it means. You can do anything if you want to. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. But here I am in the Bronx. I never worked up there. And my CEO was, his nickname was the Fuhrer. Ever worked for the Fuhrer or Mrs. Fuhrer? Huh? Everybody was afraid of him. Nobody wanted to work for him. While I was there, I said to myself, you know, Lord, if you put me here, there's a reason. I don't see it yet, but I'm going to do my best. And I decided to do my best in spite of the fact that I had to go painfully every night, back and, and day, every back and forth. I started to do innovative things in the place. And I started to change things and do things. The Fuhrer never said a word to me. I was there a whole year. I met people I'd never met before. I get a call from a chief, a black Jewish chief. I hadn't seen that man in 20 years. He calls me up. He said, John, I'm sorry I had to send you to the Bronx. Nobody else wanted to go there. He says, but I heard you're doing a great job up there. Is somebody listening? People are watching you. Huh? They're watching you, and may you may not see them. He says to me this. This never happens. John, we're making new promotions. Where do you want to work? What hours do you want to work? What days off do you want? In the faith zone, if you stay in it, you're going to come to a point where God is going to reward you for your faithfulness. I always tell people this too. Never burn a bridge. You may have to cross it again in life. Hmm? Remember that, young people. When you leave a job, I, I was at Debbie's, Debbie Quick's retirement party. I was so proud of her as people got up and just continued to Praise her for her work, for who she was, and so on. I felt good knowing that she, her testimony was with these people. Hmm? See, when you leave a job or you get promoted, you leave a witness of being a Christian. Hmm? You leave a witness. In the faith zone, we should have a testimony of goodness, hmm? of not running out as soon as the bell rings, hmm? of a job. I had a cousin, he passed away many years ago. He was our organ player and the treasurer in our church. He worked on Wall Street, he didn't like it. So he took a job in construction. He didn't know the first thing, what end of a hammer to use as a carpenter. 
His brother-in-law got him the job, and here he was on this job with all these characters that have been there for years and years and years. At the end of the day, when the bell rang, all these guys dropped their tools and ran out the door. But he didn't. He went over to the engineers, and he said, oh, what does this mean on the plans, and what is that, and what's, the, what's all this thing here? You know, you're doing something. You want to know why you're doing it, right? Six months later, the foreman retired. The big boss from the company comes down and says, Joe, the foreman retired. You're my new foreman. <gasps> All these other characters, I've been here 25 years. He didn't ask me. Why do you think he didn't ask him? Hmm? The world is looking for people who are not running out the door and stealing everything and doing everything that makes the job not work. He stayed with that company. He became the general superintendent of the whole company. He learned everything there would be about building these huge buildings. I'm not talking about building houses. These huge buildings, museums and stuff in Manhattan. That engineers would come to him and say, Joe, I drew these plans. Is this going to work? Because he knew the practical side of it. What looks good on paper doesn't always work. God will bless you if you stay in the faith zone. Hmm? It, you may have to stay a while, but when that day comes, when you're ready to get the reward, oh my goodness, you can do a little Pentecostal dance. Hmm? You see, living and working in the, in the faith zone is exciting. Every day you meet people. I keep talking about divine appointments. Every day is an adventure as a believer. People say, oh, I'm so bored. <laughs> well, you're not doing it right. <laughs> Open your ears and eyes. All around you, there are people that are hurting. You see, when someone says they're sick, even at work, don't feel good, let me pray for you. And God will bless you for that. When you get to be a supervisor, you don't become the Fuhrer. Be concerned about your people. Motivate them. Sometimes you can even change what we used to call the pails, the empty pails, the lazy people. You can change them. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Hmm? By faith. And an old song says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Hmm? You can be the best at everything that God has for you if you just stay faithful to the Lord hmm? and stay in the faith zone. Hmm? Then the Bible say you can be the head. You'll be the head, not the tail. You know where the tail is, right? <laughs> you'll be above and not below. Everything you touch will be fruitful. Faith is the victory. That overcomes the world.